A very good afternoon to all listening to our session on Zero Copy Zen Boost Performance with Member View. So speakers here are myself, Kesya Mayu Joyce. I'm ABM Joseph. We are product engineers at UST Stolby. At Stolby, we are building a travel platform to bring innovation to the way people experience travel. And we are majorly working on GraphQL microservices in Python. So I hope by the end of the session, it will not be a zero copy of knowledge, but you'll all gain some insight on zero copy and memory view. So without waiting any ado, let us move into the main agenda. Now, what is zero copy? Well, zero copy is something that as the name suggests, no copy of the data. That is, the CP does not perform the task of copying the data from one memory area to another. So what happens even to the unnecessary data copies are avoided. Well, you can say it's a method to copy data from the disk or network to the memory without passing through the CPU. So uh, what's the main advantage is that it will reduce the number of context switches between the kernel and the user space and thereby increasing the efficiency and reducing the time taken. Now, if I see a simple analogy, I can say that, imagine you have a sandwich and your friend would like to have a share of it. Now, uh, in a traditional mechanism, you can say that you create or you make the same sandwich uh, with the same ingredients, like almost the same replica of the existing sandwich that you were eating and you give it to your friend. So that way your friend could have a share of it. Or another mechanism, it could be like no copy of the sandwich. So no zero copy would be like you give your sandwich a bite to your friend. So what happens is, what was the main objective? Your friend wanted to have a taste of sandwich and that is achieved. So we are not creating any intermediate copy, but by just sharing the same sandwich to you with your friend, uh, the objective is achieved. So that is a simple example of what is zero copy. Now let us look into a traditional copy mechanism. I can say that you have a user portal and you would like to upload your resume into it. Well, uh, like a normal uh, user, you have your resume in your uh, your secondary storage. Now, what happens here is you ha you have your data that is a byte of array of data needs to be loaded from your secondary storage to the memory by the kernel, and then this information is then sent to the user space uh, or to the browser by the kernel. Now, the browser that is in the user space it shall now use their socket related function uh, to transfer the information to the corresponding socket dedicated for the job portal. Now, eventually, uh, you can say the sockets redirect this information to the kernel, which interacts with the networking hardware using the DMA, that is direct memory access. The, at the end goal, it is achieved. So what happens eventually, if you look into this uh, figure, in this architecture itself, we can understand that there are almost two context switches and there are four copies of data created, that is, from the disk to the kernel space memory, from the kernel space memory to the user space memory, and then back from the user to the kernel and the kernel to the networking hardware. Well, you can see the context switches from kernel to user space and user to kernel space. So what uh, we can see, uh, we can conclude by the tradition of Kansan is that it has um, there's a serious hurdle in the performance as the process based the CPU cycles. So that's the main disadvantage of the traditional mechanism. Now we look into the zero copy mechanism. In a zero copy mechanism, what you can say that, what if the kernel itself handles the copy of the, uh, the data from the disk to the network directly? That is, we are reducing the number of context switches and the copies of data created. So if you see in this example, you can see that at the end, the user is directly accessing the kernel, the memory, uh, or the buffer uh, in the kernel space. So we are creating a copy, but uh, the user relies directly on the uh, intermediate buffer. So this is something you can say about zero copy mechanism. If you look into the code, uh, we have a Python example code. In the first code, you can see that it's a receiving server end. And in this receiving server code, we can see that socket first establishes connection. Here we use AFINET connection. AFINET, it is of um, the IPv4 address family and of the uh, SOC stream um, socket type. So here uh, we would be listening to the port 8082 or establishing connection on that particular port. 
and then uh, we'll be iterating till we receive some data. So we are receiving data of around 65,536 bytes of data in one go. That is uh, a chunk of data being sent. So the maximum data limit is that particular size. And uh, I'm being, uh, this is my receiving end server. So I wait for uh, in incoming connections. Now, if you look into the next part, that is um, like once a connection is established, this is like the sending part using the traditional copy client. So using the traditional copy client, the, you can see that uh, you, we use send all mechanism. Here, send all is something. Uh, it's the main functionality that uses the, that is present in the traditional copy client. Well, in this send all, the entire file content is being sent to the server using the sockets send all method. So uh, you can see a copy of the data that's been created and it's being transferred. Now, uh, if you look at the while testing it, you can see that a two GB of data file is being used for testing uh, this particular code. So on testing with this 2GB file, we found that around 2.42 uh, 2 or 2.42 seconds were being taken to transfer this particular size of data. So as the size of my file increases, the time taken would eventually increase. That is uh, very obvious. Okay. Then uh, through the next part, if you check the zero copy client, in zero copy client, we have OS.send file. Now in OS.send file, that is a send file, it's a mechanism of OS, where uh, here data has been efficiently transferred from one file descriptor to another without any intermediate uh, copies created or without any intermediate, uh, without the need of intermediate buffering. So the function is particularly useful in instances when you deal with uh, large files or optimizing uh, the data trans uh, transmission between different IO resources. Now on testing this file, or testing this particular code with the same 2GB file size, we could uh, we we did uh, we did realize that around uh, 1.16 seconds would be taken. So if you compare, we can say that zero copy definitely has a significant uh, reduction in time taken compared to the traditional copy mechanism. So uh, as discussed earlier by the previous analogy, we knew that zero copy we are not dealing with any copies, but dealing with the same set of data. Thereby, the time has been significantly reduced. So this is a simple example of zero copy mechanism. Now, uh, in Python, uh, we can use this zero copy by using memory view. So let us deal into more of this uh, with the discussion by Abby. Over to you. Yes, yes, yeah, continuing uh, from there. Uh, so let's take a look at how uh, Python's on data types can be useful to work with binary data. So Python provides uh, several built-in types and modules uh, to manipulate binary data efficiently and effectively. So here are some of these uh, bytes, byte arrays, memory view. So these uh, data types, uh, these types are crucial for managing binary data, allowing us to effectively uh, interact with files, network protocols, and low-level data structures. So coming to each one, bytes. So bytes is an immutable sequence of bytes in Python representing binary data. So it's useful uh, for storing a uh, fixed collection of bytes such as data read from a file or received from a network socket. So byte will uh, return a byte object. So uh, to form a byte object in Python, we utilize the B prefix accompanied by the actual bytes. Since uh, bytes are uh, immutable, their contents cannot be uh, altered after formation. These uh, characteristics uh, gen guarantees data integrity and security across uh, diverse applications. So uh, byte data uh, represent a sequence of bytes. Uh, each byte can hold a value in the range of 0 to 255. So coming to the syntax of bytes, so bytes function takes up to three optional arguments, source, encoding, and errors. The source parameter can be provided uh, in, separate, uh, in different uh, ways, uh, depending on its type. So if the source is an integer, it, takes, uh, it creates a byte object of the specific size uh, with each byte initialized to the default value zero. So if source is an iterable of integers, uh, it creates a byte object from the integers value. So encoding parameter specifies uh, which encoding to uh, convert string into bytes. 
uh, the default encoding is UTF-8. And the last, uh, the errors uh, parameter determines how to deal with uh, errors uh, during this encoding. So uh, while observing this code, uh, data equal to bytes of four, uh, we are creating a byte object uh, with length four. So however, since bytes are not initialized with any specific value, the default value will be zero. And the type of uh, data is bytes. So here uh, in this given code, so we are creating a byte object using the constructor uh, that takes an iterable of integers as input. So since uh, bytes are immutable, uh, it uh, does not support uh, assignment operations here. So the next one is uh, byte array. Byte array is similar to bytes, but are mutable. It allows us to modify the binary data after creation, making it uh, more suitable for situations requiring dynamic changes. So uh, byte arrays are created using the constructor byte array. Uh, so since uh, byte array is immutable, uh, we can modify individual bytes or even extend its uh, length if required. So here uh, we are creating a byte array with uh, value four. Since uh, similar to the uh, previous example, since uh, we are not we are uh, not assigning any specific value to byte array, uh, the default value will be set by uh, the byte array constructor. That's zero. So we can access and modify the individual bytes within byte array uh, using uh, indexing or assignment operations. So here, the value 10 in the uh, array is replaced with uh, value 100. So coming to the last one, that's memory view. It uses a uh, zero copy view. So uh, memory views are powerful. Uh, but of an underappreciated feature of Python uh, that provides efficient access uh, to data, particularly while dealing with larger data sets or binary data. So it acts as a window uh, into the underlying data of another object, such as uh, bytes, byte array, or even array dot array. So it allows us to access and manipulate the data without uh, creating a copy. So uh, it provides uh, supporting support for slicing, just like regular sequence in Python. So uh, memory views can be created using uh, memory view function, uh, which takes an object that supports buffer protocol as its argument. So uh, in this example, uh, we are creating a memory view uh, of byte, uh, byte string uh, hello world. So here, uh, view of zero will mark to 104, which is uh, nothing but the binary or nothing but the ASCII value of uh, H. So uh, we are creating a byte array with encoding specified as UTF-8. So we can find that type of MV will be memory view. So here we created memory view with byte and here we are creating um, we are creating uh, memory view with byte array so byte uh, memory view uses buffer protocol so over to Kesia uh, for buffer protocol yes memory view uses buffer protocol now what is buffer protocol buffer protocol is a protocol that provides a way to access the internal data of the object and that object can be a memory array or a buffer or so and so. So as I said, buffer protocol, like uh, you have an object and uh, that particular data needs to be accessed by another object. So with, uh, without creating an intermediate copy, that data could be made ac accessible to the other object. So uh, the memory representation or uh, the internal memory representation of that particular object can be made, be, uh, it's made possible to be transferred to another object without creating intermediate copies. Now, uh, in Python, if you can see, uh, it uh, buffer protocol or uh, it will normally when it's perform different operations like slicing, we create copies of the data. Now, if you look into a simple Python example, you can see that uh, in this particular example, you have a list and you're slicing the list. In the normal use case, what happens is on slicing a list, uh, Python normally, uh, it creates a new what a new uh, sliced list object. 
So a new object has been created for performing uh, uh, slicing operations. So uh, maybe in some cases where you have a huge set of data and you do not require a new object to be created. For such instances, um, I feel that copies of data could be seriously avoided. Well, in a Python, uh, or we cannot directly implement buffer protocol. Why? Because this is a present in the C API level. So buffer protocol is not directly implemented. Well, we, it is made possible, or we can directly implement buffer protocol using um, the memory view library, which is present in Python. So in Python, we are able to uh, implement buffer protocol using memory view. So there are different uh, benefits out of using buffer protocol. It is that it improves the execution speed. Uh, since uh, we are not creating a copy, definitely uh, it improves the speed. The next is uh, we use less memory uh, for accessing the data and uh, thereby improving efficiency. And the third one would be that it, uh, it works on large data, as I said. Well, if you deal with buffer protocol, there are two main terms that you would be familiar with. That is uh, buffer providers and buffer consumers. So objects that provide this memory views, that provide memory view are called the buffer providers. And objects that consume the data of other objects can be known as buffer consumers. So these are some terms that we would be familiar while learning about buffer protocol. Next, dealing with PEP 680. Uh, so PEP 688 is a, a Python enhancement proposal that says that making buffer protocol accessible in Python. So we are making sure that uh, memory view and the benefits of using buffer protocol is made aware to different Python developers and making it much more user-friendly. Well, Python, uh, well, PEP standard 688, um, it uh, promotes the use of memory view, that is memory view dot from underscore uh, buffer is a new built-in library to create memory view much more easier. So it makes sure it is uh, it can be widely used. Then it has enhanced the support of memory view and it has simplified the workflow of um, easy of the easy access to buffer protocol within Python uh, within the Python code. So in in a way, so using this uh, PEP standard, it has uh, improved or boosted the performance and uh, increased the efficiency throughout the program. So that is about PEP standard. Now, if you go to the next, we know that uh, there are different applications of memory view so that you can dive more into memory view by learning uh, from Abby. Over to you. So coming back to our discussion on uh, memory view. So uh, let's uh, look into this uh, snippet. Uh, so here we encounter two variables, S1 and S2, uh, with uh, byte and byte array values. Uh, so we proceed to create memory view instances, namely S1 view and S2 view uh, from these uh, corresponding variables. So the initial print statement examines whether the memory view uh, originating from S1 uh, that's uh, containing bytes is designated as uh, read only since uh, bytes are immutable. So following that, the subsequent uh, print statement verifies read only status of memory view uh, generate from generated from S2 containing byte array. The mutable nature of uh, byte array in Python grants the memory view both read and write privileges to underlying data. So in this code, uh, you can create uh, you can create uh, byte array S2 containing the bytes hello world. So then uh, you create memory view of that S2, that's S2 view from the byte array hello world. So next, uh, you can slice the values. Uh, you can uh, assign the Python uh, value with uh, the string world. So here, memory view allows uh, this modification because uh, byte array is mutable. The output of uh, final print statement will be hello Python, showing that the modification was successful. So uh, since memory view object uh, S2 view references the same buffer or the same memory updating in S2 view also updates in S2. So moving on, uh, we import the module array and create a signed long integer labeled A using the function array.array with L. Subsequent memory view is also initiated with uh, this array A. 
So upon uh, invoking M of zero, the first element of M review is extracted. Similarly, uh, M of minus one retrieves the ultimate, uh, the final element of memory view uh, mirroring the terminal element of uh, array. So furthermore, uh, we can also provide uh, slicing operations with memory view. So uh, let's look at uh, the comparison uh, over to Kesia. So looking to which is better, we have learned about what is memory view. And uh, so looking into the difference or the speed and uh, which is much more efficient, with our memory view, we have a, a particular snippet. In, uh, in this example, we are um, iterating through a chunk of data that is of varying size from uh, one, uh, one lakh to uh, around five lakh. The data has been iterated of a varying size. So I created data in the first case uh, of, uh, of a byte into uh, uh, almost that mean, uh, the, the data is being uh, multiplied to that many times. And then we have uh, what happens next is the sys being the data is iterated. The data has been iterated by slicing each time. So I slice the data from first index to the end. And uh, as you know, with our memory view on slicing, it creates a separate object. So I would, I would like to compare the time at that particular case. Now without, uh, with memory view, we are dealing, we'll be slicing on the memory view of that particular object. So uh, as we know, memory view would not be creating a new replica or a new copy of data, but would eventually work on the same data. So this is with memory view example. Now looking to the time difference, we can see that without memory view, takes around from 0 0.24 to approx uh, 4.3 uh, seconds are being taken with our memory view. But with memory view, we can see that almost the entire time is almost approximately equal to zero. That is, even though the data has been increased, uh, the time limit is significantly less on comparing with without memory view. So uh, this, uh, this actually shows, it can be concluded that uh, with memory view, the time is significantly less. Now, if you look into the graphical representation, you can see that uh, the blue line denotes without memory view and the orange line denotes with memory view. So it is obvious that as the size of the bytes increases, the time taken uh, would definitely increase on uh, if you work on a data without memory view, that is you work on this data by creating uh, replicas over and over again. Now, uh, when you work with memory view, you can see the time taken is almost equal to zero. Well, there are different applications of uh, memory view in our day-to-day -day, uh, life. Well, one such application that I can talk about is uh, numeric and scientific computing. Well, we all know about NumPy and SciPy libraries. Well, there are some uh, libraries that we use significantly on uh, dealing with uh, large arrays or large data sets. So memory view, if you use memory view on such a data set, it will efficiently improve our uh, calculation and transformations on arrays without copying the data. Well, if you look into this example, in this example, we're dealing with a particularly large size array and um, we're creating a memory view of this uh, array. So uh, the main objective of this particular uh, snippet was to double the values of the array of that many chunks of data present in that huge size of array. So I'm doubling the values each time so on DDM memory view, without creating copies, I'm able to transform the data. So this will reduce the uh, speed and increase the performance. Uh, to learn more about other applications, I would like to hear from Abby. Okay, uh, so let's take another example of uh, video streaming. Uh, so video streaming in Python uh, using memory views can be achieved uh, by leveraging the power of memory map files and uh, number arrays. So it provides access to data uh, directly without copying it. This can be useful for efficiently streaming larger video files without consuming too much memory. So let's uh, take an example of a media server. Uh, we are creating a media uh, server to uh, stream videos to user over the network, granting them the ability to view the real-time content without the need for any prior downloads. So a pivotal element of the system involves granting users the capability to govern video playback, permitting them to advance or uh, rewind, thereby giving them the freedom to skip or uh, revisit the particular segment. So to realize this functionality within the client application, one can accomplish it by making a request to server 
for a particular data segment that aligns with uh, the time index uh, chosen by the uh, user. So here uh, we have two functions. In the first function, time code to index, we can implement the logic uh, to convert the time code uh, into the byte offset of the video. So this calculation will depend, uh, depend on specific uh, video formats and how uh, time codes are mapped to the byte offsets. So the second uh, function, uh, request chunk. So we can implement the logic uh, to fetch video data from the given video, the given offset uh, for the specific size. Uh, so this will involve reading the video data from a file, or it can be from a remote source, depending on our use case. Also, throughout this example, we'll set the value of uh, offset uh, to be uh, 20 megabits. So uh, the effectiveness of uh, this code will rely on two primary uh, elements, the duration uh, for extracting 20 MB video segment uh, and the time record for the socket to dispatch the data to the client. Assuming the second factor, that's the uh, socket speed is practically ideal. Uh, after benchmarking, we can see that it took almost uh, 4.9 milliseconds to extract 20 MB slice of data to transmit to the client. So uh, this problem uh, is that uh, we are slicing, when we are slicing a byte instance causes uh, underlying data to be copied, which takes uh, CPU time. So a better way uh, to write this code is using a memory view concept, which exposes Scython's high performance buffer protocols uh, to programs. The buffer protocol serves as a lower level C API that allows uh, Python runtime and C extensions to uh, access the underlying data buffers behind objects uh, like uh, byte instance. The key advantage of a uh, memory view instance is that uh, they are sliced. Another uh, memory view instance is created without uh, initiating a copy of underlying data. So let's create memory view uh, that wraps bytes instance and examine the slice. So by uh, leveraging the zero copy mechanism, uh, we can see we have uh, significantly enhanced the speed of code uh, that needs to process a large amount of memory quickly. So uh, we are almost at the end of the presentation of zero copy. So now let's discuss on benefits of zero copy concept uh, through KSA. Over to you. So, okay, so on dealing with the benefits, we know that uh, we have heard that it can reduce the memory footprint uh, by not creating any intermediate copies and the overall memory usage can be uh, reduced. Uh, the next, uh, we could say that the next benefit would be that uh, it improves the performance. Okay, yeah, it improves the performance by avoiding data copies. You can significantly reduce the time and resources required for data processing. The next is it improves the scalability, especially when dealing with uh, distributed systems or multi core processors. Uh, scalability is one factor that we will all look into. And uh, this would, using memory view, it would significantly improve up um, scalability. The next is, um, I can say that in conclusion, I could say, uh, just remember that zero copy technique is not just about shaving a few milliseconds from your code, but it will help us to ensure that we all think critically when we deal with applications like video streaming or uh, maybe networking or other such applications that deal with large data sets. So we should all be uh, aware of when to use memory view. Then um, thank you all for listening. I hope you will all look into memory view and get the gist of it. So happy coding and have a nice day. Thank you.